Good morning. So today we're going to be looking at the idea of putting together a project using Lejos, the operating system that allows you to write Java code for your Lego robots using Mindstorms. We're going to be using the Lejos EV3 robot, or Lejos EV3 robot, as you can see where I have the Mindstorm object right here. And a couple things you want to look at at the robot itself. This is just uh, the basic build of the robot you have by the instructions for the Mindstorms object. We have a touch sensor right here so we can use that. It's plugged into port 2. And we have a ultrasonic sensor plugged into port 1 so we can actually see some distance on that. And if you look at the actual robot itself right here, it gives the um, power level of the robot up here in the top corner, whether or not it's connected to Wi-Fi in the top right corner, and most importantly and very helpful, the IP address of your robot on the top middle of your screen. This is really important. So we've got a couple things we want to actually make sure we address with that. So that's the information about our robot right here that we have. We also have our robot has as its motor ports A and B, and we have a differential motor set up for that so the motors are on the same axis. So we can use that to do control and drive on that. And we'll use that to, for a couple different pieces on that. We also have a Wi-Fi port plugged in and the SD card in there so we can actually use Lejos on there. We'll be talking about that here in just a second. So looking over here at the actual project, we have right here on this folder, I'll maximize this screen for us here. We have in our folder, we have a folder called Lejos EV3. And that EV3 folder has the information we need to actually deal with our project. And this project, all this uh, stuff is what we need to actually put into our project so we can access to it. It also contains the components we need to put this on our computer. So we have right here on this folder, we have the ej.tar.gz. Um, this is the Java library for the Lejos robot. This file needs to be copied to the root directory of your SD card that you're going to be putting on that. We have the SD500 zip, which is the image you need to put on the actual frame, which is the SD500.img file, also right there. And then we have the Lejos image.zip file. And this Lejos image is the stuff that you have to put at the root directory of your SD card after you've run the image on it. So these files right here need to go on that. And this is a Linux image. It's running a, a distribution of Linux, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I highly recommend using the Linux tools for this. It makes life a lot easier. However, if you're unfortunate enough to run Windows, there are some tools you can use to help you go through that. Look at the Lejos.org website to help find stuff for that. And so this is the basic stuff you need to have on there. I have put this all right here in a single folder called Lejos EV3. It makes it really easy to find. And I have that listed right here inside my home directory so I can quickly find it. Because by this Lejos EV3 folder, I, the Lejos EV3 folder, we use this all the time inside our Lejos project or Java project so we can actually access the code for it. So again, like I said, I have that whole folder of Lejos EV3 and I keep that inside my home directory. And again, you can get all the source code for this on lejos.org on the um, wiki page. But Switching from that, going back to Eclipse, let's take a look at the Eclipse settings for that. And we've got our Eclipse project right here. And in our Eclipse project, let's go ahead and take a look at the way I've got this set up. Now, just like all of our projects we've been doing all year for the, this project, we have the idea of a model view controller for our projects. And we have in our source folder, I have a couple packages. I have a controller package and a model package. And again, we're using that same idea that we've used all year long. However, if you notice, there is not a view package on this because we don't see anything with this. We're not actually going to see anything for the um, EV3 robot. We actually have the robot itself. We're going to be watching for that. So we've got that available for us to use. So what we're going to have inside our controller, we have our standard runner. Our runner is just simply... Um, the name of the object dot, um, that controller, and we call the start method. But you'll notice something different about a run that we've done throughout the year. Our class name, instead of simply just being the name of our project and the runner attached to it, we need to make sure that we name our runner something that has our name on it so we can differentiate from any other project we're running for that. Because, say for example, you're doing this in a classroom setting and you have lots of people doing robot projects. If they all have it called Bot Runner, there's only be one program called Bot Runner that's actually running on the robot. So you have to make sure you give it a nice differentiation. In this case, Cody Simple Runner, just a quick way to say that it's my robot, my runner. Okay, so it's a little bit different than we've done before. Then we have our Bot Controller. Our Bot Controller is that basic framework we're going to be using for it. We have our import statements in here. We're going to be using a couple uh, components for this. And in our bot controller, as you can see, I've got the import Lejos hardware.lcd.lcd. So I can immediately start my display. I can identify that I'm using this robot. And I have a delay that I'm importing for this, so I can have it wait for a certain amount of time. And the actual robot code on that, so I can get references to things on this. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. This is our model that we're using, a reference to our model object, because we're having a reference to our code inside that. Inside my controller, I have the basic startup right here, where I have a message, X and Y positions, and a wait time. And this is so when I start my program, I can make sure I've ad actually made the connection to my robot. And I have my EV3 robot that I've created right here. In the constructor, I initialize that value for that to programming legal robots with Java. And I start in position of 10 and 10. So it's going to be fairly near the middle of the screen. To make this even better, it's really actually quite good to change that to 0 and 1. And you can automatically see that available right there. 
This wait time dot 400, or excuse me, this, this dot wait time passing at 4,000 as a value says it's gonna have that show for four seconds because it measures in milliseconds. Nice little thing right there. And then very important, we wanna make sure we initialize our robot. We need to make sure we always initialize our code inside our constructor, otherwise we get our dreaded null pointer exceptions. Yeah? Now, again, we're using our start method to have everything happen, make sure we make the connections. And so in our start method, we just get that basic startup where we're gonna say the lcd.draw string, passing the message and where we want to draw that message and how long we want to wait before it does anything else. In this case, we'll have it show the message, program Lego robots with Java for four seconds. And then we have it call our robot drive room because we made this called Cody bot and we call the drive room method on that. So let's go ahead and let's take a look in our model package to see that. Inside our model package again, we've got quite a few different more components in here. Import statements are a lot deeper. We have a lot of components that we're using for all of our robot components on there for whether it be port or our screen or the motors themselves. We also have the ability to make the stuff for our robot itself, which is the chassis and the navigation components. We still have to use the delay so we can have it wait for a certain amount of time. And then we have specifically for our sensors, the touch sensor and ultrasonic sensor for those basic components we're using in our project. We take a look at our declaration section. Again, I've uh, reinitialized those parameters right there for message, position, and wait time because I can have that update for this specific project. But then I also have a move pilot. This is how I can have a better control of the robot itself when I'm actually doing my programming. I have references for my two different sensors we'll be using. And I have a touch sensor and a distance sensor. And we're using that with ultrasonic sensor and touch sensor. And notice that we have a prefix on these of both of EV3 type so that we know that we're actually using an EV3 robot for these. And then because the EV3 system for Lejos is different than everything else, for the storage of our values, they're stored inside an array. In this case, we have a float array of ultrasonic samples for the ultrasonic sensor and a separate array. We're going to keep that for our touch samples for our touch sensor. And we're, we're, we could have one giant sensor for this or one sensor array for it, but it's much easier to keep track of based on which one we're using, I think, and keep track of those simple parameters with that. So we go to our constructor. As you can see right here, I initialize my uh, message, my position, and my value. So I have some information about that by default. And then I have my distance sensor and touch sensor also initialized. When I initialize the sensors, I pass it the local ev3.get. This static method right here returns the instance of the connected robot. So this connected robot is going to be the first one it sees on the Wi-Fi connection. So if you want to connect to a specific one, this is what we were talking about with the idea of that sensor communication and that IP address. If you want to talk to a specific robot, rather than just grabbing the first one it sees, what we need to do is inside Eclipse, we go to our preferences. Again, if you're in Windows land, you're going to be under the window dropdown. Go to preferences. We go to then to EV3 section. And first thing we have to make sure we've specified is we have our EV3 home specified. In this case, you can see that I've stored my EV3 folder right here. I have that set. But then if I want to specifically connect to a specific object, a specific robot, I type in the IP address right here. And I type in that name for that, and that's where I'll connect to that specific robot. So I always connect to that one robot immediately for that. Hit apply OK to make those connections. We'll get out of that. But we want to make sure after we do the local ev3.get, that returns the specific robot. Then we actually assign the port that it's attached to. And this is where it's really important. Again, as we saw on the robot right here, we have the ultrasonic sensor at S1 and the touch sensor at S2. If I were to swap these and run my code from this robot, after installing it, it's going to give me a, a port communication error on the lovely screen right here saying that it's the wrong kind of information because there's, this is not a touch sensor and this is not a ultrasonic sensor. It's going to say you got, it's going to give me a nice lovely error. It's going to crash and give me unhappiness. So you want to make sure that you have these specified properly. And again, notice this is S1, not 5.1 or 52. We have to make sure it's S1. It's with a capital S. And that's how we identify we're using sensor port 1 and sensor port 2. We'll fix those right back up so we don't have to worry about that. Now, on my assignment that we're doing right now, we had it so it had to drive around the room, and the room is a collection of distances. And so what I made is I made a distance array called room distance. It's a double array, size four. There's four turns it has to, or four um, distances it has to drive. And I made a helper method to deal with that, as well as a helper method for my pilot, and my call message helper method, so I can show me where I am inside my code. So, send it my distance array. I just put in some default values to get that going, where I'm saying it's gonna drive these distances, so room distance sub zero through three, and it's going to be 12 times 2.54 times 3. And I'm actually going to change that distance right here for all these since we actually want it to be the 254. So it actually gives us the correct amount of value rather than simply just some decimal number because it's actually uh, not using centimeters for that. So we have that basic information. That means it's going to drive long enough to actually drive across the room for that. And then we want to make sure we actually initialize our move pilot. And so what we've done right here, let's go ahead and maximize the screen so we can see this a bit better. And we'll press an enter key so we can see this. 
As you can see in our setup pilot, this is the helper method we've used to actually initialize our robot. We have our left wheel and right wheel. Our left is on motor A, our right is on motor B. We specify how big our wheel is and what its offset from the center is. And then we say that we are gonna go, our chassis is gonna take a new wheel chassis, passing it a wheel array, and we initialize that array immediately by simply passing it left wheel and right wheel. We then say what type of um, chassis it is. It's a differential chassis. And this means it can um, have those two wheels that are directly across from each other. Again, right here, the wheels are directly across. It's a differential chassis. So it means we can easily control it and have it drive back and forth really easily. The next thing we do is we assign that pilot that we have, that move pilot, to be a new move pilot passing that chassis object. So that chassis object now allows us to control a robot as necessary. And we then have our drive room method. This is the public method. This is the one we would be calling externally. And as you can see right here, I have this line ultrasonic samples is a new float array. And it, what I do is I pass it the float array for the bigness of it, the length of that array. I pass it distance sensor dot sample size. The distance sensor dot sample size means I want to make this array big enough to hold any distance sensor results. And then Anytime I want to check the, uh, how big I've used, I have to make sure I call distance sensor at fetch sample. I pass it the array and the offset. That allows me to have this check right here where I'm gonna then check to see if what's at stored at that spot is less than 2.5. Now this is not the best answer. This is just a sample answer we're using in class to get kids to start programming. But you have to actually figure out the calculated answer for that. If that was the case, I'd have it display the short message and making a short drive and call my drive short helper. Otherwise I do the drive long and call the drive long method. And once it achieves that uh, status, I would be at the other door because it actually drove across the classroom. We have two different display message helper methods. We have one where it simply just drives the message. It's the class message we have with initialization. Not the most helpful one, but one we could use later. But the really helpful one, the overloaded version, where I can have it, I can pass it a message so I can call things as needed. And that's what I've done right here for the display message. I can say that I have a specific message so I can tr troubleshoot my code, look at my robot, see what it's saying I should be doing at that time. And then if we look at our drive short method, I'm using the idea of a loop. I have right here, I'm using from spot is equal to zero, spot is less than the length of the array. And I go up one time. And I display a message I'm driving and how far I'm going to drive in units. And then I have it drive that distance. And then if my position is an even position, I make a left turn. Otherwise, if it's a right, um, an odd position, I make a right turn. So I can drive across the room appropriately. My long drive is the exact same thing, but going the opposite direction. I start at distance dot length. I go until I'm greater or equal to zero and go down a spot each time, again using that same basic approach and then changing which direction I turn. So that's where we're going for that. We also have the idea of using a drive around method. Again, this is not the best one, but just a way to get the idea of how to make it so it can drive around and not hit things. And so as long as you're not pressing the escape key, I want you to pick some random number for a distance, another random number for an angle to turn. And then if it's positive or not, take another random number. And if it matches zero, make it even. And then I'll grab this distance sample. I'll check to see if it's less than some number, in this case 17, and go from there. Thank you, and have a great day.